I never liked long walks. I used to hate coming home when it was almost dark, with ice cold fingers and toes, feeling miserable because Bessie, the nursemaid, was always scolding at me. All the time, I knew I was different from my cousin, John Reed. He was taller and stronger than me, and he was loved. I always wanted to join the family circle. But Mrs. Reed, my aunt, refused. So, I crept out of the sitting room and went into the small room next door, where I chose a book full of pictures from the bookcase. I always climbed up onto the window seat, under the curtain, in order to hide myself from others. Lost in the world of imagination, I forgot my sad, lonely existence for a while. And was happy. I was only afraid that my secret hiding place might be discovered, and it did happen when suddenly John Reed opened the door. Where are you, Red? Where are you? What a bad man she is! There you are, in the window seat. What do you want? Master Reed, say what do you want, Master Reed? Want you to come here? How dare you? What were you doing? I was reading. Reading? You have no right to take out the thing. You have no money. Your father left you none. Everything here is mine. This whole house. I'll teach you not to take my things again. I was in a great pain, and suddenly, for the first time in my life, I forgot my fear of John Reed, and I began to fight back. I call him a cruel boy, a bully, and a murderer. However, suddenly my aunt, Mrs. Reed, shouted at me and pulled me away, and locked me in the red room. Red room was where my uncle had died in. I was so scared of his ghost, so then I fainted inside that room. Doctor Lloyd, who Mrs. Reed called in for her servants, was looking after me so kindly, and said that I suffered no serious illness, but the shock left me nervous and depressed for the next few days. I knew I had no one to love me, and nothing to look forward to. When the doctor came again, he seemed a little surprised to find me looking so miserable. He asked me what had happened and how I felt, replying despairingly, "I have no father, or mother, brothers or sisters. It would be great to live here, but I don't know where else to go." Suddenly, he popped up with an idea, asking if I would like to go to school or not. I knew nothing much about school, but at least it would help me get rid of these cruel relatives. It would be a change, the start of a new life. On the morning of the fifteenth in Jory, I was informed that a visitor wanted to see me. Who could it be? I was afraid. When I nervously entered the room, I looked up, and could see a tall, thin man dressed all in black. With a cold, stony face at the top of the column, looking at me. This is the one I want to meet. Well, Jenny, I knew a little child. You want to talk about that? Perhaps talk about that. Okay. I'm sorry, to hear that. Come here. Jenny, I know some person. Okay. Well, I'm going to kick go after the death. Yeah. Okay. 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 And what must you do to avoid getting there? Just stay healthy and not to die. The answer has told me that you have never read the Bible. You really have a wicked heart. If you want not to go to heaven, you must pray to the God. Please make sure that the teacher at Long Wood knows how wicked this uncle she is. She will like what she do. Don't worry, madam. The teacher will watch her very carefully. Gets hurt. Tired and.
confused after the journey. I followed the servant into a large building, where she left me in a sitting room. In came a tall lady with dark hair and eyes, and a large pale forehead. I discovered that she was Miss Temple, the headmistress of Lowood School. Oh, you, you are too young to be sent alone. You look tired, aren't you? A little, ma'am. How are you, and what's your name? I'm 10 years old, and my name is Jane. Well, I hope you will be a good child at school. In the next morning, the ringing of a bell woke me up. Although it was still dark, I got dressed very quickly in the bitter cold room and washed when I could. When the bell rang again, we all went downstairs and entered the cold, badly lit school room for prayers. As the bell rang for the third time, how glad I was when it was time for breakfast. After breakfast came our playtime. I walked out and could see a girl reading a book. I felt brave enough to speak to her since I like reading too. What kind of book is that? Wow, I like so much. By the way, what kind of school is this? Um, it has a public school and it has a charity school. Everyone here are charity students. The next day, I could realize that the girl I had been talking to, her surname seemed to be Burns. I was surprised that she was given punishment several times with a stick, yet she did not cry or change her expression at all. Later that day, during play hour, I found Burns alone, so I started to talk to her. And what is the rest of your name? Helen. And would you live Lobo Helen? Why? Why would I? I was sent here to learn, so I must learn as much as I can. But the teacher was so cruel to you. Cruel? Not at all. She just seen my mistake. If I were you, I would hate her a lot. If she punished me with a stick, I'd seize it and put it into her nose. I don't think you would, Jane. If you dare, Mr. Prococcus will send you away. You should read Bible and do what Chris say. Those people who believe in God should love their enemy. Suppose I should love Mrs. Reed and her son, which was really impossible then. By the way, let's get back to our class then. Okay. It was difficult for me to get used to the school rules at Lowood and to the hard physical condition. One afternoon, when I had been at Lowood for three weeks, a visitor arrived. Everyone paid respect to the tall-looking man as he entered the schoolroom. I had been afraid that he would come and tell everyone about what Mrs. Reed's description of my character. I had hoped to hide my face behind my book, but then it fell from my hand and made a sound while everyone in the room was all quiet. I could definitely know what would happen next. What a See this girl? She is young and ordinary, but she is sweet. Her aunt told me that she was a bad influence to her children. Teacher must punish her and look after her well and punish her soul out of her body if she had one. No one should talk to her and she must stand here for half an hour long. Tell you what, students, she is a liar. Don't talk to her. 
so there I was, standing up high publicly, displayed as an ugly example of evil. Feeling of shame and anger boiled up inside me, but just as I felt I could not bear it any longer, Helen Burns walked past and looked calm at me. What a smile she had! I cried hard that day, and she sat with me for some time, talking gently, wiping my tears and helping me to recover. She was the only friend I had in Lovewood. Time flies. Life at Lovewood no longer seemed so hard. However, Helen Burns could not come walking with me because she was ill, not with the typers, but with tuberculosis. At first, I had thought she would recover, but when I learned her illness was serious, I decided to visit her for what might be the last time. I found her lying in bed, looking pale and weak. Helen! <laughs> You've come to say goodbye. You are just in time and going to... To where, Helen? To my home, my last home. No! I'll avoid suffering and going to heaven. In the next morning, Miss Temple found me asleep with Helen Burns dead in my arms. Gradually, the typhus fever left Lawwood, but the numbers of deaths made the public aware of the conditions in which pupil live. Money was raised to build a new school in a better position, and Mr. Brocklehurst lost his position as the manager. So, it became a really useful place of education. I stayed for the eight more years, the last two as a teacher. I was busy and happy all the time. When Miss Temple married and moved away, I decided that it was also the moment for me to change my life too. I realized I had never known any other world apart from Lovewood and Gates Head. Suddenly, I wanted freedom, or at least a new master to serve. So I advertised in a newspaper for a job as a governess when I received an answer from a Mrs. Fairfax who wanted a governess for a girl under 10 years old. I accepted with the permission from the headmistress of Lovewood. Thornfield Hall was a large gentleman's house in the country. In a town called Milkwood, after my 16th hour journey, I was welcomed by Mrs. Fairfax. She was the housekeeper, and my new master was a Mr. Rochester, who was often away from home. My pupil was a girl called Adele, seven or eight years old. One day, I took the opportunity of asking Mrs. Fairfax a few questions about Mr. Rochester, as I was very curious about him. Some information that I got from was that our master is really confusing that you could not really understand him at all, but he is indeed a very good master. One day in January, that I had a free afternoon as my pupil was ill, I decided to walk out to Hay, a village two miles away, to post a letter for the housekeeper. It was a bright, frosty day, and I was enjoying the fresh air. Stopping on the lonely road, I heard a horse approaching. Suddenly, there was a crash as the horse slipped and fell on the ice, bringing down its rider. I ran to see the traveler, who was swearing furiously as he pulled himself free from the horse. Are you hot, sir? Can I have you anything? Just stand back. Thank you, but I don't need anyone. But I'm God, sir. I live near here and I'm not afraid of being out alone at all. Um, I'm going to Hay to post a letter and I'll be happy to offer you a hug if you need. Thank you, but just take your letter to the Hay, then hurry home. When I came back home, the servant told me that Mr. Rochester has arrived. On the next day, people kept coming to visit the master on business. I really enjoyed the new cheerful atmosphere, and in the evening time, I was invited to talk to Mr. Rochester after dinner. As then, I realized that he was the man that I met that day. Good evening, sir. Oh, Jay. May I 
Days later, I was invited again to see Mr. Rochester in the garden. However, this time, he didn't look so stern. There was a softness in his fine dark eyes. Do you think I can have some? Normally, I would have taken time to think and say something polite, but this time. No, sir. What? You are a little quiet person, but why you are so rude? I'm sorry, sir, but. Maybe I should have said that um, beauty doesn't matter, something like that. No, you shouldn't. You criticize my appearance and you stab me in the back. All right, tell me, what's wrong with my appearance? Look at my head. Do you think I'm intelligent? I do, sir. Um, is it okay to ask if you are good? What? Stabbing me again? Just because I tell you I don't like talking to old ladies and children, it's not mean that I'm bad. Well, I want to be good when I was younger, but I went on the wrong path when I was 21, and I never find the right path again. I might be as good as you, but I did wrong. It was not my character, but yet circumstances to blame. But why am I telling you all this? Because you are sort of a person that people tell your problems and secrets to. Mm, asking for forgiveness might cure it, sir. No, it won't. It's difficult. Soon, I discovered what Mr. Rochester meant when he said he had done wrong. He told me the story of his love affair in Paris with a French dancer named Celine. He was so in love with her that he rented a house and hired servants for her. As he was visiting her but found that she was out, he waited on her balcony. He horribly saw her with a man. She was having a conversation with her new lover. He couldn't stand no more that he walked into the room to tell her that it was over. He thought that was the end of the whole thing and left France for a few months. However, Celine had a baby girl, Adele, and she claimed that Adele was his child. Even though he doubted it, he still raised her well after her mother abandoned her and ran away to Italy. I felt proud that Mr. Rochester had trusted me with the whole story of his past life. I thought a lot about his character, and although I was aware of his faults, I also see the goodness and kindness in him. From now on, my happiest moments were spent with him. I could not have imagined a better companion. In one night, I was woken by a slight noise. I felt sure someone was outside my bedroom door. I knew it could be Grace Poole, who was a really strange servant in the house. There must be something wrong with this person. I opened the door and found corridor full of smoke. I saw it was coming from Mr. Rochester's door, which was slightly open. I completely forgot my fears and rushed into his room. He lay asleep, surrounded by flames and smoke. I helped to put out the flames away and to wake him up. Again, no, sir. There's been a fire. Um, someone has plotted to kill you. When you open the door, have you seen anything strange? No one, sir. Just only the candle on the floor. Um, but I've heard a strange voice. Grace pulled off like that. 
Yeah, maybe that must be Grace Pool. Say nothing to anybody else and go back to your room. Okay, good night, sir. What? You leave me already? But you said I should go. But without a goodbye, a kind word or two, and you just save me and I owe you my life. Mm, I think I hear Sylvan moving, sir. Well, leave me. Wait, stop me. How could I imagine that a gentleman of family and wealth would love a plain little governess like me? Just look at yourself, Jane Eyre. Stop dreaming. So, you want me to take your fortune? Well, I must warn you, I don't believe in your trick. I expected that. Why don't you tremble? Why don't you turn pale? I'm not cold, and I'm not ill either. Why don't you ask me to take your fortune? Oh, I'm not a fool. <laughs> Actually, I can see the happiness is waiting for you, if you really want it. To those fine people in that room, isn't there one person you're interested in? The master of the house? It depends on whether you're going to stretch out your head for happiness. Your face and mouth show me that feeling that are important to you. But your forehead shows me that common sense is your main guide in life. I'd like to stay here looking at you forever. But I stopped acting now. Was I dreaming? Suddenly, the old woman's voice had changed and become as familiar to me as my own. Mr. Rochester stepped out of his disguise. Sir, you've been talking nonsense to make me talk nonsense, and it's hardly fair. Do you forgive me, Jane? I shall try to, but you shouldn't have done that. Jane, if all those fingers of mine come and spank me, what would you do? And if they whisper behind your hands about me, well, what would you do? Mm, I'll stay with you to comfort you, sir. And what if the whole world disapprove of me and left me one by one? Will you stay with me? Mm, well, if you deserve my friendship, as I'm sure you do, I wouldn't mind about those people disapproval. Thank you, Jane. Yeah. For a whole week now, I had dreamed of a small child every night, which was a sign of trouble to come. A message came from Gateshead saying that my cousin John Reed, who had wasted all his mother's money and been in debt or in prison most of his life, had killed himself a week before. Also, Mrs. Reed, whose health has been badly affected by worrying about her son, had suddenly fallen ill. Although she could hardly speak, she had recently managed to express a wish to see me. And so they sent their coachman to bring me back to Kate's head. I felt I could not refuse to see my aunt, perhaps for the last time. So, I went to ask Mr. Rochester for such a long leave, and he allowed me to go with some money. How are you, my dear aunt? Are you Jane Eyre? Yes, I am Jane Eyre, my aunt. Before I die, I must confess something. First of all, the promise that I have made with my husband. Secondly, please take this letter and read it. I hate you so much that I wrote back to him telling him that you have died due to typhus fever at Longwood. It is my revenge to you. You shall sure deserve this, you will keep. Oh my dear Anne, don't think about that letter anymore. And I was not as weak as you think. I would have loved you if you let me. Forget it all and kiss me now, my aunt. But it was too late for her to break the habit of this light, and she kept turning away from me. Poor woman. She died soon afterwards, keeping her hatred of me alive in her heart. After her funeral, I set out the long journey back to Thornfield. Mrs. Fairfax had written to me, 
telling that Mr. Rochester had gone to London to buy a carriage for his wedding. Obviously, it would be him and Blanche and Graham, and the marriage would be held very soon. I had to remind myself sternly that Thornfield was not my permanent home, and the person I was looking forward to seeing was perhaps not even thinking of me. So, I decided to confront him about my leaving from Thornfield. I cannot stay here anymore, sir. Why you have to leave, Kate? Why? Because you're marrying Miss Ed Brown. She's your future bride. My bride? I have no bride. But I still have one, and you must stay. I ask you to be my wife. Will you marry me? Don't you believe me? Oh, listen, I don't love Miss Indra, but she doesn't love me. She only loves my world. But your strength makes cross spirit. I love you. Have you seen it? Do you still love me? Do you want me to be your wife? I swear. Well, if you really want me to be your wife, I'll marry you then. When I entered the room, I realized that Grace Pool I've been calling was the another person, and the one who was trying to burn Mr. Rochester that night was not Grace Pool, but Bertha Mason. She was the one that Rochester married 15 years ago. She was a really wild and person, grow like a wild animal. She stared at me very fiercely. Rochester announced that it was a wrong decision marrying her, since his father was a really selfish person who hated to pass down his money to his sons. So he was arranging Rochester to marry the daughter of his best friend to let him inherit that family's wealth. However, even if he told me that, I still could not make up my mind. I just knew that I didn't want to stay there anymore since he already married a wife. Wait, Jane, where are you going? I cannot stay here, sir. I must leave you now. I must go and explore the new world of the future. No, you must be my Mrs. Rochester, and I will be your husband forever. Your wife? Your wife is still alive, sir. I just be your mistress if I go here. I cannot stay here anymore. Goodbye, sir. After I leave Rochester, I was delivered to another place. I was put down at Bit Cross, a crossroad on the moor. After traveling for two days in the coach, I was glad to see there were no town here, because I didn't want people to question me, 
or pity me. I was craving to death, so that I decided to try to reach for a house in the distance. But there were no one. Sadly, I dropped onto the wet doorstep, worn out and homeless, prepared to die. However, a guy found me when he returned home after a few minutes. He saved me. His name was Saint John. He was a priest. He seemed stern and cold. On the other hand, he made determined efforts to discover who I was, but I just firmly said that my name was Jane Elliot, not Jane Eyre, and refused to explain more than necessary. I'm gonna tell the rest of the story, but it's better if I tell you the story. Twenty years ago, a poor Quaker fell in love with a rich man's daughter. The couple got married, and two years later, the couple died. The baby was raised up by an aunt. She worked in Lowood School. She was a get paid. Just tell me about Mr. Rochester. Did Mr. Brick write something to Mr. Rochester? Why? I don't know anything about Mr. Rochester. Are you Jane Eyre or Jane Eyre? Yes, I am Jane Eyre. And doesn't Mr. Brick know anything about Mr. Rochester? I don't think it is. You forget the most important point. Don't you want to know why he's been searching for you? What then? Only to tell you that your uncle, who is also mine, Mr. John Eyre of Madeira, is dead. And he left you with all his property. Nothing much, I guess. About 20,000 pounds. So we are cousins, aren't we? We are cousins. Yes, my mother was here. The Mr. Brick wrote to us that our uncle was dead. He left all his property, but not to us, to his brother daughter. Yay! Finally, I could have a brother to be called, to be loved, and to be proud for the rest of my life. I made a suggestion to offer St. John 50% of my sudden wealth, but he protested strongly. Still, I managed to convince him of my firm intention to carry out this plan. In the end, we agreed to fairly share the inheritance. He used the money to continue his dream, traveling around the world as a missionary to serve his God. We spent a lot of time together studying and sharing things. Hence, we became closer and closer. One moment, while we were walking on the moors, I will be living in six weeks, Jane. Will you come with me as a missionary? Oh, come on, Street John, don't choose me. God intended you to be a missionary wife. Trust in him, Jane. Marry me. Oh, I'm ready to go to India with you, but as a sister, not a wife. A sister can marry and leave me anytime. I need a wife who will obey me and stay with me until then. Come with me, Jane. Say you marry me for the service of God. Mm, I'm sorry, cousin, but I cannot. In the morning, I went on a journey back to the love of my life, Thornfield Hall where my Rochester was staying. However, when I reached there, I stood still in horror. There must have been a great fire. How had it started? Had any lives been lost? A hotel owner in the village answered my questions that the mad wife, who was such a psycho, must have understood enough to be jealous of Mr. Rochester who had been wildly in love with the governess. Anyways, in the fire, the master risked his life and badly injured, losing the sight of both eyes. He moved away to another house. It was 30 miles away. The next day, I took him outside for a long walk in the fresh air. I described the beauty of the fields and sky to him as we sat close together in the shade of the tree. So Jane, what happened to you when you abandoned me so cruelly? I told him my story, and naturally, he was interested in St. John Rivers, my cousin. 
So, that same song, do you like him? Yes, he's a very good man. I couldn't help like him. And he's in his late 20s and he's a very young man. And in fact, he did ask me to marry him. So, well, leave me and go, Jane. Go and marry that St. John. I cannot marry him, sir. He doesn't love me and I don't love him either. Um, you don't have to be jealous. All my heart is yours. Jane, will you marry me? A poor blind man and 20 years older than you? Of course I will, sir. Now, I have been married for 10 years. I know what it's like to love and to be loved. I am my husband's life, and he is mine. After two years, his sight began to return in one eye. He can see me a little, and when our first child was born and put into his arms, he was able to see that boy had inherited his fine large black eyes. After all, we lived our life happily ever after. Drop my ass and then a beetle I'm tripping too hard, I had to ditch her on the D-Lo 